first up is public comment. This is public comment for the Liquor Control Board for anything that's not on the agenda. Not seeing any, we'll go on to approval of the agenda. I'll move to approve the agenda. Uh, I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Recording in progress. <laughs> Slow on that. Uh, new business, we have license applications for the Forge and Wit and Grit. Any reason not to do these together? Let's do them together. Was that a motion? Yes. <laughs> You're so intuitive. I know. I'll second it. Gosh, that sounded familiar. So motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, entertain a motion to adjourn the liquor control. I move that we adjourn the liquor control meeting. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? <laughs> Probably not, huh? We'll call the uh, select board meeting to order. First up is public comment. This is anything not on the agenda for the select board. Not seeing any, so we'll move to approval of the agenda. Is there any adjustments to it, Trevor? None that we have for you. All right, motion to approve the agenda. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. First up is consent calendar. This has uh, meeting minutes and warrants. Motion to approve the consent calendar. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. New business. First up is the Energy Advisory Committee Climate Action Request. Do we have Gary, uh, Gary Durr with us? Um, I, I don't I see don't Gary. See um, <laughs> he should be here. Uh, I, I spoke with him earlier today and he indicated that he was gonna be calling in. Yes, yes, well, I've spoken with him also and, and he indicated that he would be here. Um, All right, so, um, Maybe we can just uh, look at uh, what he sent in and um, I, and see if anybody has any questions before we even decide if it's ready to be moved. Um, I read through all of this stuff and my concern is that it doesn't look like, first off, I think it goes outside of the scope of the energy committee with some of what's in here that we're being asked to approve. But I'm really concerned that we don't see what this would mean to the town of Randolph, the residents, the businesses, if this was approved. So, you know, what I see is just a, you know, we did these actions during town meeting. Oh, here, let's push somebody's, somebody else's version of the people's climate action plan. But it doesn't look like it's, Randolph specific. And I'm not sure all of this is really Randolph specific here. Uh, I, I'm not clear exactly what it is that um, Gary and presumably the Energy Committee are expecting us to. It looks like they're asking us to endorse the nine points of the People's Climate Action Plan. Um, I just don't, I don't know how that's relevant for Randall. Yeah, but Tom, did you read the, hang on, Susan, it's board okay. discussion for a second here. Uh, did you read the links to the bills? I mean, it's yes, getting into I, I environmental justice. It's getting into wealth redistribution. Uh, yep, topics yep. that, in my opinion, aren't climate change and are not the energy committee. No, I would 
I would agree with you. Of the nine points, it looks like four of them are directly tied to, to climate issues, but they're much more expansive. I agree with you. So what I, I took the time to reach out to some other towns that have taken this up and they have not passed it as um, the, the group that's promoting this people's um, plan. They've kind of looked at it specific to their municipality and said, you know, these are the things we think that of this plan, the municipality should get behind in promoting. Mm -hmm. and here's what we want to see come out of that, you know, if we said, you know, we want a weatherization program, what does that look like? Is it for individual homes? Are we reaching out to commercial users? Are we looking at, um, you know, public buildings? But it's kind of um, getting a little bit more, instead of making a broad statement, actually coming in with, here's what we want to see happen. Like, there's no action here. It's called an action plan, but there's really no action. Oh, let's have people do weatherization. Well, that's great. Like, what does that look like? Huh. I feel like we've co we, we covered a lot of this ground, broadly speaking, in the uh, town meeting last year, or earlier this year, I should say. So I'm not quite, I agree with you. I'm not quite sure what the, what the intent of this is other than to add our weight behind the nine points. And you're right, none of the nine, not all of the nine points directly relate to climate issues and, and, and there are no action steps. It's just words. Um, so Susan, did you want to make, uh kind of address that some? Sure. Um, well, um, yeah, I'm on the Energy Committee and and um, at our last meeting, we um, looked at this uh, because we, we have a lot of projects that we're working on. And um, we we look at this as a guide. There, there's, it's not binding in any way, um, but it looks, we look at it as a guide as, as we take, um, do our projects in, the future and and right now too, and there's a lot of very direct um, correlation between these these nine points and the projects they're working on. Uh, like you said, there's there's no act particular action steps, um, but we look at it as a guide. And um, there are um, a number of other en energy committees who have endorsed this as well, uh, and there is one other uh, select board that has endorsed it uh, in Thetford. So. Um, and yeah, like you say too, the, the town of Randolph uh, uh, endorsed uh, many of these, not these points as, as written, but there's a lot of correlation between what was passed um, last year at town meeting and these nine points. And I think John Pimentel can speak to that uh, really well because he was very involved in getting that, helping to get that passed. So, uh, maybe, uh, go there, Susan. Is the committee opposed to going back and developing more of a plan that addresses Randolph uh, versus buying into? Um, my concern is that there. I read the language. You're asking us to support bills that are before the legislature, and I I did not go and look and see what the status. Are they stuck to the wall and not moving, or are they ones that? You know, I don't know what their status is in the biennium, but like environmental justice, wealth redistribution, those things to me are not energy and they're not climate change. So when I, but when I look at some of these other, I would, I could support some type of plan that talks about a weatherization program um, and some of the, the basic energy pieces that are in there and trying to get, you know, the state behind some initiatives that that we could directly tie to benefits to the town of Randolph. Because remember, we're doing this as a municipality, not as a person who has, you know, this, this goal 
in their life of, of supporting some of this stuff. But as a municipality, what does that look like for us, you know, on some of these topics? And I don't see that here. You know, should the town of Randolph be aggressively having uh, energy audits of our buildings, for example, uh, and prioritizing some level of funding or whatnot towards meeting a certain goal. Those type of things I can get behind. I really have a hard time getting behind broad statements. And you've probably seen that if you followed anything uh, that I do. I like to see a, if we're going to pass a plan, I want it to show what we're going to do, not be a kind of bold statement that doesn't have any teeth to it or action item associated with it. And I just don't see that here yet. I want to weigh in here for a minute. So Go ahead. The, the planning commission, you know, there, there is a town plan. We've talked about energy an awful lot in the town plan. We've had numerous conversations for better than two and a half to three years about the needs for that two rivers has weighed in on what we need here as a as a community to you know meet these 2050 goals and <clears throat> so if we're going to do that i agree with trini that we need specific plans that are related to the community and not just broad-based paint the brush type stuff so in this particular case i know that you know these conversations you know that we were having we needed something like 180 acres of solar to offset you know what the towns or what the communities energy demands were and so you know i think we currently have less than 18 acres is what i'd last remember hearing from tori so we've got a long way to go here you know and i don't think painting a brush here with some of these things that i read in that that proposal are are going to get you there that's it just it's it's not going to make it so if we're going to get serious about this then i think we need a specific the energy committee needs to come up with a specific way to figure out how we're going to get that done and and, and yes we need the legislature's help but you know, if they're going to do this and they want this done, then they're going to have to figure out how you're going to fund all this. Because I, for one, you know, run into obstacles when I'm trying to put put solar on my building because I'm not getting any help from the banks on this. The banks, you know, look at this as a, you know, it's like another piece of equipment. It really doesn't get anything tied to your real estate. So it's very difficult to finance solar. So if you're going to finance all, if you're going to get all the solar in place, you're going to have to figure out how it's going to get financed for businesses. So those are the kind of things I'd like to see coming out of the Energy Committee. Well, the other thing I've heard, Perry, and I've, we've experienced it is if it's not big enough, the companies that'll come in and do it are not interested. So you're right. back on your own 100% having to finance it. So there's Correct. the incentive for these companies to participate or, you know, not there. that's an item that should be in this plan. This plan should say the legislature should be continuing incentives for these businesses to do all sizes of solar, you know, it just, to me, it's just missing those details. I'll share one more little piece of that. So I was gonna put solar on my roof at 14 Hell Street. So by the time I was able to figure out how I was gonna finance that, okay, I had ex my, my, CP, my, uh, my certificate of public good had expired. So I went back in to renew it and they wouldn't renew it at that point in time. So, it's like, what's the point? So, so there's an obstacle here. And that's where I think if the energy committee is surely serious about this, then that's the kind of stuff that you need to be talking to, to your legislative representatives about, about how we're gonna fund that stuff for small businesses. Well, in the Global Solutions Act, there is, it does address the, uh, the, uh, the cost issues and ways of, of paying for these but I think we have an opportunity with Norwich Solar, who will put whatever solar you want on for free and really reduce won't. your electricity costs by 30%. Nope. That's not going to work on somebody who's got a building, Gary. I'm sorry to tell you, but you have to. It, so, so here I go put solar on my building. I need to own it, okay? Because if I want to sell that building in five years, okay, it's a detriment for me to have somebody else owning the solar panels on my roof. Yes. I'm sorry, but that's not how it happens. No, 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 well, I, I stand corrected. I'm only really talking about such things as the school system, uh, the municipal building, the, the, the town waste facility down there. And that it would be my proposed way to start putting the solar on. 
But we don't see any of that in this plan, Gary. That's what I oh, want to see really. in this plan. And then I think you also got to look at, you know, there's only, there's very limited amounts of property that are held by the municipality and the school. So, and I'm right there with Perry. We looked at putting solar on top of the storage buildings down on Beanville and Norwich Solar told us, put up a couple more buildings and then we'll come talk to you. There's four big buildings there that could all have solar on their roof. They are engineered for solar. And they were like, yep, put up the other three and we'll come chat with you. Well, so they'll get in contact with me substantially in the last two months because they have uh, on the, on the uh, Gifford property uh, some available solar that they were going to originally uh, sell to the school system and the school system couldn't head it now. So they're looking for people who can use this. And I know at least one company who could probably take all that use and uh, that would reduce the number of acreage or the megawatts that are that are uh, asked of, of the town. So if we have to find 180 some odd acres for solar and we're way below that level now and we can't find somebody to use the solar we're generating, what's that going to do to us when we get to maximum? You know, these are things that you got to look at and we should be seeing in here. You know, here's our plan. We're going to try to do this with this type of entity to get them to install solar to get X number of acres. And here's how we're going to help them connect to people who can use it. Well, this is not our plan. This is this is something that uh, that came from 350. Uh, and that's Vermont. where the problem is, Gary. That plan does not work for Randolph. OK. Can I jump in for a minute? This is Jeff. Jeff. And uh, thank you for the time. And uh, I didn't realize you started so quickly. You jumped right in on this. I apologize. I'm late. But yeah, just to reiterate, this is not a plan. We have all kinds of actions that we're ready to, to look into and um, give you some specific items to look at. This, these are just guidelines that we we're going to use as um, principles when we when we did develop the energy plan. And we thought it would be good to work with other towns and to to show the state that we're very much in support of this. And I'm 100% with you. We need to be working directly on what's gonna influence Randolph. But as I read these nine points, there's nothing in here that I disagree with. I mean, I think everything that's on these nine points lines up with what's in our town energy plan and what's already been approved in article 32. Um, and yeah, I just, don't want to make sure we this is not our plan. We've got lists of all kinds of projects we're going to look at, but these were just guiding principles as we look at the projects that we would use to develop the plan. And so we Jeff, also want to work, I'm sorry. Yeah, I would love to see those principles be specific to energy, mm -hmm. not the other arena that's entertained here, and then show where those principles become action. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you have a list of things you want to do and where you want to go, then it would be great to see an actual action plan that the Energy Committee is looking for the select board to endorse for them to go and implement. Well, uh, other towns have done similar things like Hartford and another town uh, or two. Uh, and we, I know people who are on those um, committees or councils and we will look to better understand how they went about it and generate our own plan really to 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 meet the needs of the select board and and, and the manager and uh, and you tree yeah and i don't think we need to take too much more time on this i i do think we need to you know we'll get some direction from what you'd like to see as a select board and we'll work with that plan because again there's you know we don't need more studies. We know what we need to do and we know where the low hanging fruit is. We just have to see how it fits in with Randolph with the assets we have and the money we have, which both are limited. So it's gotta be a realistic plan. And you know that's why we're here to, to present that to you. And um, I think we do need to, you know, we probably need an hour or two of your of some of the people that are interested on the select board just to get 
a little bit of guidance on exactly how you would like to see that formatted because we've got the material. I think we're struggling with, you know, just how to format it and, and what actions are really priority for the town. I wouldn't be opposed to us scheduling a special meeting that is warned so that more than two select board members can participate as a work session between the select board and the energy committee. Perfect. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I'd like to reiterate what I'd like to reiterate what, what Jeff was, was saying a little while ago uh, that at this People's Climate Action Plan, it's it's not a local plan at all. Um, I, I just want to make sure that that's really clear. I know that Jeff just said that, but I just want to make sure that we realize this is not supposed to be something that we're going to be doing here in Randolph, per se. This is um, these are statewide policy ideas, and we're being asked to get behind them to help generate momentum to get these ideas implemented at the statewide level. It's really about, you know, putting together the political will from the grassroots level to the select board level to in the legislature and getting people on board so that as we have this opportunity, you know, over the next generation to implement all these climate policies, which are going to change our landscape, they're going to change our transportation, they're going to change our economy in lots of ways. And that when we're doing that, that we're recognizing the fact that there are marginalized communities that have been affected for generations that have not been um, recognized. And we now have, have an opportunity to consciously go ahead and make sure that these folks are included very specifically as we move forward. Um, and, and we have not done that in the past. And that's what we're being asked really to do tonight is to lend our little tiny voice to the other voices in Vermont calling for this kind of equal treatment of people who have been historically marginalized in our communities for many, many years. This particular thrust really came out of the, of the uh, council, the, the climate council. Uh, there's like 23 members on the climate uh, council and they are charged with having a action plan for the state available by December 1. So we were kind of pushed into action as a result of this. But we totally get it that we really got to localize it to Randolph, the Randolph towns. I think you do. And I think I understand there's a statewide initiative there, Larry, too. But Trini, back as to a you. town, it would be nice to understand what that means. Like, I read the two bills that were being asked in as part of this to push through and say we support. And I really struggle to support a couple of those, to some of the language in those. Um, so, and I, I really struggle to connect it to energy committee. But I think Pat had a comment. I did. Um, could the energy committee, if they want to send that letter on their own behalf to the committee that's working on this, and then the Energy Committee and the Select Board get together and work on local priorities. But the Energy Committee send it just as their their thoughts. I think that is possible, but what do the rest of the Energy Committee think? Sure, we can, we can do that. Um, uh, we, I mean, we voted when we voted unanimously to support it. I, I get, I guess the, just the one other thing is that we, we really, um, I mean, certainly it has to be specific to Randolph, but we, we really need to collaborate with other towns. With uh, like we've been collaborating with um, with Bethel on some projects recently, and and we'd like to do more of that. And it, it's a bigger issue than just Randolph too. It's, it's a state issue for the funding too. Just one example. We did a very successful community solar project a number of years ago, and we'd like to do another one. But the some of the, the rules have changed, and it's much more difficult now to do community solar. I have community solar on my house because it doesn't face the right direction, and it's wonderful. And it would be great to do more of this. So these kinds of guidelines um, that apply to everybody are really helpful for lots of towns. Yeah, I think, uh, let me just go back to Pat's question and maybe Trevor can help us with this some. Um, the Energy Committee is advisory to the select board. Um, does that give them 
authority to send letters up on state policy? I mean, usually you see the flow of, um, if there's a policy statement to be made, it really is up to the legislative body to make it. There have been instances where advisory committees might weigh in on particular issues, um, but it's generally, I think, a, a better practice if there's one policy statement that flows consistently throughout the organization after, after plenty of conversation, um, that'll have the most impact. I think most accurately re represent the broadest array of people. So it, is it possible? Yes. Is it a, a best practice? You know, that's where there's some debate, I think, to be had. I, Trina, may I, Tom Evans. Um, I, I would rather see the Energy Committee directing its energies at practical, um, achievable action steps with timelines and goals. And, I don't have, broadly speaking, I don't have a problem with this, this uh, resolution that's been put before us, but I, I question how much impact it's going to have um, on state decision-making beyond our own legislators in the House and Senate advocating for it on their own regard. I don't know how much impact the select board of Randolph stepping up and weighing behind these nine points is, is going to have. I would rather see the energy committee pick four or five of those points and sit down with us in a working session and come up with a concrete plan for we're going to do this in this time frame, and here's what we're going to do to ease the transition to a sustainable energy economy in Randolph, rather than um, you know passing a in a lot of respects, a kind of feel-good resolution that says these ideas are, we like these guidelines. Let's act on some of the guidelines that we can concretely act on here. Uh, who's speaking? Is that you, Tom? Tom yes. Ayers. Oh, okay. I, I'm the only I'm the only select board member that's actually physically in along with Brave Soul. <laughs> um, actually, well, it's such a uh, long walk from home. We, as as, Su, as uh, Susan said, we're working closely with the uh, Bethel Energy Committee. Uh, it's right. only been in existence for maybe three years, but they've really leaped to the forefront. They have what you're asking for, like 10 things that we're going to do, and it's embraced by the select board. So well, I, that's, that's, that's my point, okay? We, we have- That's exactly what I want, want to see. Good. Yeah, I mean, I know, for example, okay, your largest energy consumer in this town is Vermont Castings, okay? Right. So <clears throat> there's there was a proposal thrown out there at one point by, by a company, okay, who wanted to come here and build solar that was willing to talk to them about how to totally offset that facility's, that, that facility's usage, all right? But it never went anywhere. So, I mean, this was three to four years ago when, you know, we were having these conversations about how yeah, big the that, solar panel right. bees. So now you're limited to how big a solar field could be. So you've just taken that equation right off the top. So this is my problem with this whole thing is we did what the townspeople wanted when we developed the policies, okay, about how big a solar field could be. And consequently, what we did was we eliminated what the largest user in the community, okay, by not allowing them to do that deal. So those are some kind of things that we need to figure out how you're going to overcome those. So this is where I have this problem with we want one thing, but we don't want it. We don't want it because a lot of the residents don't want to see it. We went, we've hassled this over for four or five years now. You know, I've been involved in this since Two Rivers came to the Planning Commission right in the beginning and said, okay, this is what we're going to do by 2050. Well, here we are, and we're not getting much further, and we have a major energy consumer here. We're, we're, we're a little unique in that respect because, you know, being a rural community, having them here, you know, has created the, the need for us to offset our energy usage. We're probably one-third more than what we need to have because I think they're using a third of the energy down there. So that's, so that's a, great, a struggle. Yeah, we're not. That's, a great, that's a great point, Perry. We will definitely. Okay. Look into so that. if if you're going to do yeah. something, you know, I can't get behind something that's you know, oh, it makes it's a feel good thing here. Okay, and this is my opinion. This is a feel good deal, and you know, maybe it's a little piece, and and I think we as a community support this kind of stuff, but that's not a concrete plan to get us moving forward. And the clock is ticking. Okay, right. it, it's 2022 here coming along. All right. And we're supposed to be at some point by 2025 and 2035 and 2050. I don't think we're getting there very quickly. 
Well, it, I have a kind of a, a, a little guideline of what we wanted to talk, and I'm going to jump to the to one of the last point. Um, we want to do what you're asking us to do. And we are proposing that the Energy Committee uh, comes to select board meetings and gives a report on how much we have accomplished towards meeting the 2025 and 2030 requirements. They're not goals. The, 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 uh, the Global Solution Plan took those goals and made them requirements. So I, I just I'd like to jump in and, and say that I, I definitely agree that the Energy Committee should be doing the things that you're talking about. I think that's a great idea. Um, the, but I don't know if that's really that's not what this agenda item is really about. Um, and I, I'd be happy to talk about this more tonight if we want to or some definitely some other time. But we're really about you know focusing on this people's climate action plan, which the Energy Committee has endorsed and they're asking the select board to endorse. Um, is it going to go any place at the statewide level? Well, it's not if none of the select boards statewide will endorse it and enough people don't come behind it. Yeah, then it's not going to go anywhere. Um, but imagine the, uh, and if we do it and no one else does it, or if just us in Thetford does it, then yeah, it's not going to be a big voice. It's not going to carry a lot of weight. But we are a voice. And if a lot enough other select boards were to join us and, and endorse this kind of thing, then it will get the attention of statewide leaders um, and it will make a difference. That's how those things happen. Is it guaranteed to happen? No, but if we all think that the, the, the ideas in here are basically sound ideas and they're things that we'd like to see even if they're not necessarily likely, then we should just stop talking about it and say that we're gonna be behind this and we can then talk about something else. So Larry, help me understand how environmental justice and wealth redistribution is part of a climate action plan. Well, I didn't, I looked at the bills and I didn't see anything in there about wealth redistribution. Um, I saw- I did the third of one of them. I, I saw um, lots, of, um, lots of, um, of measures that would make sure that historically marginalized communities are given the opportunity to do well in the climate economy that we are going to be um, in um, in the current in the in the in the coming years, that mm -hmm. as we as we transition you know, to more solar power, power, that as we transition our transportation economy, as we transition to more weatherization, that we are making a conscious effort to make sure that people who have in the past been left behind that they're included. That's really all that I see in here. I don't I don't see anybody taking money from one pocket and putting it into someone else's because of, of anything like that. I see it more about it's, it's opportunity for people to catch up. So who do you think's being messed here? Because we've had weatherization programs in this community for 15 years and, I, and community was it community action has been involved in those things. So, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not figuring out how I just can't wrap my head around what this, what this is supposed to do because those kind of programs have been in existence. We have fuel assistance, Okay, we've had weatherization programs, you know, in 2014, this stuff, I think, is when this started showing up. And I'm not sure what what we're asking the legislature to do. I mean, what's the changes that need to happen to make this happen? Well, the problem is, Perry, and I can proudly say that the Energy Committee and the Energy Task Force has really zeroed in on all those things. We work with vital communities. We went, we work with CCRD and I, I'm just proud of what we've done, but the scale of the problem is so large and the requirements to get to the 25 and 30 plants are so huge. We just got to figure out what the right starting point is. So we do our fair share. So maybe you're telling me the goals were set too high to start with. I, uh, yes, they, they were. And, and, and what the state did not do is, is fund these things so that they could actually happen. Exactly. Yeah. That's my problem. Uh -huh. So if you want to create, if you want to fix this, okay, I'm not sure that those points that you guys have shown us are the ways to fix it. Okay. I don't think that gets it there. What needs to happen is you need to take down the barriers to get these kind of projects financed. 
Okay, because not everybody's going to work with the Norwich Solar. Okay, I was already to put it on my roof, but then when I went to the bank, it's like, no, nah, well, they're not really interested in that because it has an effect on the real estate. And I could have offset my uses. Okay, plus I could have offset some other people's uses, but I can't do it if I can't get a finance. I'm not going to roll four hundred thousand dollars out of my pocket here to make it happen. Can I make a comment? Uh, just a second, John. So. Okay. I, I just went back and I read these bills, uh, Larry, and I'm getting it out of H-273 under legislative intent. And my concern about this is it's been rolled into the People's Climate Action Plan, which is not Randolph specific. And nobody has looked at if the, leg if the legislative board of Randolph gets behind this and pushes it, what is the impact to the people, the businesses, the economy of Randolph? It's all good to get behind it and all those statements and feel warm and fuzzy, but what does it mean? What's it going to do? You know, where there's statements in here and they are about wealth redistribution. They're talking about, uh, you know, people having uh, access to have purchased land and property and whatnot. And that first off has nothing to do with energy, has nothing to do with climate change. Uh, one of the four you know, subcommittees. We've got some of the buzzwords in there, but my concern Pretty, one is. One of the four subcommittees. Hang on, Gary. Okay, the, sorry. The, my concern is we don't know if these bills are passed, what the impact is to the people that we've been elected to help represent. And that's where my concern is. The council formed uh, four subcommittees, and one is all about equity for people of all incomes level and, and, and every race possible. And, and they are charged with working with the other subcommittees to make it equitable. That's where that, that, that comes from. But so we got to figure out energy? how to personalize this to the Randolph towns. And, and I agree. So what is that for energy? Like, what does that mean? Equity to what in energy? Energy to weatherization more. programs to but both to access to banks that will finance solar. You know, uh, it's, it's action. Like we talk about these things, but there's nothing in there that's going to like. How does that all interpret down to the low-income homeowner in Randolph? Well, that's that's the action item for us, the Energy Committee, you know. But, be, to, to but how do you expect out, me to make a proposal? Okay, so how do I get behind it if I don't know what that is? You don't. You're uh, right. You you charge us with get, getting you the documents you want. And, and that's all, that's exactly where I'm at, Gary. Thank you, John. No problem. No problem. We get it. I, I, I may be speaking out of turn, but but I imagine the uh, Energy Committee would would be willing to drop from the resolution they're proposing things that uh, members of the select board find offensive and are are not able to support. So I, I, I wouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater here. Um, I wouldn't say they're offensive. I just don't see how they're related. Okay. That's that's my okay. that's my point. OK, I'm not saying these things are offensive. And I'm just figuring that they're not connected. So I think if you're going to develop a resolution here, the resolution to ask the legislatures to figure out how to, my opinion, how to figure out how to find more funding for these projects if you've created these goals that you want us to obtain. If I could finish speaking, please. Yes. Um, so so if if there are issues that 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 uh, aren't acceptable, then I, I think the Energy Committee may be open to uh, re removing those. Um, with regards <coughs> to you know state state funding one way to push the need for state funding is to in fact endorse resolutions such as this which go to the legislature and also go to the vermont climate council which is in the process of drafting the plan through which the state will address uh the climate issues so you know i i, I hear you perry that 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 money is not available but money will never become available if the state's um, uh, residences and towns do not make their voice heard with what they desire. Um, you know, so 
one one other point is 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 you know we we addressed act 32 a little over a year ago and there hasn't been any real discussion um, pointed communications from the town to the uh, legislature or the vermont climate council you know moving forward on solving this problem is is kind of like having a garden you you don't just throw seeds in the ground and walk away and come back in six months and harvest something or expect to harvest something you have to nurture it throughout uh, its life and and this is one of those nurturing steps where where we're again making our voice heard where we're again making sure that uh, the people in the legislature and the Vermont Climate Council are in fact addressing all of the issues that people in the state find important so you know these nine points correlate to you know most of the things we passed in act 32 that's 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 true but uh you know again in order to make things move forward we have to from time to time readdress and, and resubmit uh what the position of of the town is and 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 what the people are looking for and this is one of those moments where we have uh you know uh, an opportunity to nurture that because the Vermont Climate Council plan is in its infancy. It's in the draft state and it's still changing. We have an opportunity to make sure, you know, they're addressing things that do result in a just transition. And a just transition means essentially that it's not the little guy that gets hurt. You know, it's not the little guy that bears the burden. It's shared, but you know, equitably across the entire um, business world and residential world of, of the state. So, you know, this 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 isn't a feel good resolution this this is a resolution that is important to continue to move the whole conversation forward Thank and you. we don't have just till december 1st uh because the plan that's when it's due but uh, i went to the renewable energy vermont conference a couple of days ago which i've gone to for 15 years and they said there that it will be worked until it's modified and acceptable to some time in March. So there's plenty of time to get our act together. And so let me just help uh, put this in perspective a little bit what I'm thinking. If I apply for a grant and I said, I'd love to plant flowers in town, give me a hundred, give me a thousand dollars. Probably not going to get awarded, right? Right. But if I can, if I can give, you know, Larry and Jay, a plan that says, look, the town of Randolph would like to take on these initiatives. And here's what we need. Here's our action items. And here's what we're going to need for funding for this. They're much better armed to go into the legislature to say, gee, I need these language changes. And I need this level of funding. If just in my town, I'm going to be able to make this change to meet what, you know, because I've seen Two Rivers has said, you need, you know, this breakdown of solar and this breakdown of whatever. Like, what does that translate to? You know, Larry could go in and say, need $20 million. His peers are gonna be like, for what? And we well, haven't armed Larry with that information and that level of detail to be able to say, well, let me show you what I need. I need- well, the subcommittees have baked into, into their proposals or plans uh, funding for fund funding uh, for them. I promise I have seen them uh, those plans in there. And we know we have uh, from federal and via the state money probably for a year, but there are no there's no certainty about year two and 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 beyond. And I think item number three in uh, what 350 VT says, fund a 10-year weatherization plan. But the battle, I think, really comes down to where do we get all this money? Excellent question. So I'll That's give you an hard. example. How much money did we how much money did the legislature last year allocate to we need more broad we're, we're going to expand broadband across the state, right? How much how much was it was Larry? 150 million, 200 million COVID money? You're on mute. Yeah, I believe it was $100 million. Yeah, okay. So here I am on Route 66, and I just dropped off, and I can't just have video and, and audio at the same time because I'm still stuck on a, on a telephone line, okay? 
and I'm on Route 66, and I've been on EC Fibers case now for almost 14 months. Tell me, oh, you've got to have some conduit in the ground. You've got to have a string in it. It's been done. And I have had this conversation now going on three years when the government, the governor told me three, I don't know, three or four years ago, that, oh, we're going to have broadband everywhere just, you know, that, that's a high traffic area. Well, I don't think I'm more any more high traffic between Randolph and BTC. Okay, but I still cannot get broadband. And we just spent another $100 million. Okay, and there's more money in the queue. Okay, and I still can't get on broadband. So, well, you know, this, on, on all these, hold on. So all these energy programs you're talking about are going to require substantial amounts of cash or Absolutely. regulations or banks to get behind them before or, or tax credits or something before you're going to get them on the table. So that's the kind of thing that I think this resolution should be looking for. That's my point. Well, I agree, Perry. we were all asked <laughs> to give in, in, input to, to the, the council and my input was, where is the money come from? It's my biggest worry. The other big item I, I brought up, do we have a, a, a infrastructure process so we can do these things quickly? And the answer to that is no either. So infrastructure and money is what it's all about. Oh, hold on a minute. It's not about all that. It's also about regulation. Okay, well, so so you're, you're going to find so, so so you're going to find you're going to run into obstacles. Okay, you can get the funding. All right. So what if you get the funding and then you know you're all set to go, but now you've got to go deal with the regulations. You've got to go through Act 248. Okay, to get these processes to happen. So you're going to run into struggles. And in my case, where I wanted to put solar on the roof, if my CPG is expired, why wouldn't they renew it? You know, at that point, I had the funding and I was ready to do it. That was all pre-pandemic. And you know what? Now I'm glad I didn't because I needed that cash to keep my business afloat. However, I'm just sharing with you that when you can't get an extension on a CPG, what's the point? Senator Bray is considering putting forth a new bill to deal with these exact points we're making, Perry. Well, then why don't we get a resolution that supports that? Agreed. Uh, we don't, we, I don't think we need a brand, but you know, this is like a blanket resolution that somebody's handed to you guys. Okay, well, why don't we draft our own? And if you want to sit down with some members of the select board and put that together, I'm happy to have a working meeting to do that. Well, yes, I, I can confidently say that the Energy Committee is, is look, would look forward to that opportunity, but we're also considering something like what Bethel did with their 10 action plans. But yes, we got to work this together. Um, I don't want to. Uh, yep. Go ahead, Don. Okay. Um, uh, to what John, to John's point of a few moments ago about uh, perhaps looking at a resolution or a resolution to this issue, if you will, that that looks at addressing selected points in the nine-point plan. I think that's a good way to go. And what I think is a good way for us to go is to actually say. I mean, looking at an example point here, there's one, a point that says provides access, point five is provides access and resources to farmers who want to practice regenerative agriculture, prioritizing BIPOC farmers first. Well, just above that, it talks about providing weatherization programs to Vermont's housing stock and prioritizes the needs of low income and BIPOC communities. I would argue that most farmers in this state fit into the low income. <laughs> community uh, models. So, but my point is, why don't we have the Energy Committee look at, let's work with our farmers here in Randall. What can we do to help you achieve regenerative agricultural practices right here in Randall? And then go to the legislature and say, here's an idea we have from Randall to, to make regenerative agriculture a center of our rural um, energy action plan. And do something concrete rather than just passing a feel-good resolution. Give people some concrete examples of what we can do and then say, here's what we need the money to do. Here's what we want to do. We need your support to make it happen. And, and there is money up for grabs and, and, I, and, uh, and, that, and that works because it, it, it comes in buckets. So we should get as much as we can out of the right bucket for and, our community. And, and to Tom's point, that's an excellent idea because 
when you think about who has the available land to create that solar field on, if you can figure out how the agriculture and the solar blend together, I know that's happening. But those are the fellows you should be working with to help them, but they all need to be educated in the process. Well, there was a there was an incentive for reclaimed property to get a bonus a bonus on the price for power generated from solar. At one point, that expired. You know, so I, I think we could sit down together and we could give you quite a list of things and help arm Larry and Jay when they go into the legislature with here's some concrete things that we've seen that have worked. Here's some things we need. This is what Randolph needs in particular. Like, I get it that there's these statewide initiatives and all that. I've been around the block long enough in state government to know the politics and all that. But I'm not really as concerned about the statewide stuff as I am about Randolph. And we need to look at what works for the low income family who can just barely keep ownership of their home as it is in Randolph and how did they get some help with weatherization and energy improvements to lower those costs all the way up through to the businesses that want to make that as a choice to change their energy source and how they get what they need to keep functioning. We have a broad spectrum in Randolph and we need, I would like to see us come up with a plan that says, this is what we need. This is what we think it's going to cost. Here are the different programs that are out there that if we could get funding from them, will help us reach some of these goals. And then let that be information that Larry and they have to say, look, you know, this program only has a million dollars in it, but Randolph alone needs two million to make this happen. That's unrealistic. You know, you can't, we can't expect our legislators to go in and fight the battle for us if we haven't armed them with the data they need and the specifics they need on what it's going to take for us to make that a success. I don't think we've done that. More well, than I, I, think we, we, I think we agree with everything that, that you're saying about Randolph and being specific to Randolph. Absolutely, we agree. It, I think we can do both. I guess that's that's what we're, we're saying, that th this will be the broad picture. And then in addition, we'll d definitely, uh, we are working on projects for Randolph specifically. I would love to see us set the example. And I think we can. You got it. So uh, what I'm hearing is it's time for a a uh, joint meeting between the Energy Committee and the Select Board, and we should advertise that as a special meeting so everybody from the Select Board that wants to can participate and we're not limited to the two before we trigger a meeting to advertise. I think that's completely realistic for us to, to do that and then see if we can't come out of that meeting with some real um, pointed goals and deliverables that result in a an item that we can support. Am I picking all that up right? So are you are you asking for someone to move that we table this current resolution uh, or 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 I'm not quite sure how you want to proceed to. So sometimes we don't take action on some items, right? We, it's up for discussion. Right. And I think what I'm hearing now is there's enough turmoil there that we're not ready to take action. I mm -hmm. think our action item is to have uh, Trevor help us with a doodle poll or something that gets the select board and the energy committee together into one date and time that the majority of us can meet and talk about this and figure out what does that action plan look like for Randolph? Well, I can do it in a week, but if I, we can't arrange it in a week, I couldn't do it to, for three or four weeks face to face. We could always zoom you in, presumably. Fine. Um, I'm tied up until 
the 15th of November. So I'm just not taking on any more workload at that till that point. So love to be involved in this and I think I should be, but not until after that. I'd be very eager to participate in such a meeting. I think it's really important, as, as so many people have said, and Trina, you've made that point really clear, and I think you're absolutely right. At, at the same time, we've been asked to do something, I think, which is pretty straightforward here, which is to either endorse or, or not endorse this People's Climate Action Plan. Or a portion um, of it, or a portion of it. And, and well, maybe, but we've been asked to, 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 to take action, and um, Unless people really feel like they need more, we need more discussion at some later date, or that people need more time to think about where they stand on this, um, I think we should do what we've been we've been asked to do. And I'm, I'd be prepared to to vote on this tonight. Um, if other folks feel like they would like to wait and do this next month because you're not comfortable, you don't know enough, or you'd like to give it some more consideration, I would be okay with that. But I don't think we should just ignore this. I think we should. Um, you know, do what we were just asked to do. That's that's the agenda item. I think that if you want to move it, you you can, and we'll take it up if there's a second to it. Okay, well, I'll move that we approve the People's Climate Action Plan that we that we endorse this this document that our Energy Committee endorsed five zero. I'm not hearing a second. Hearing no second, the motion dies. Um, I think our next step is to schedule the joint meeting with the select board and the energy committee and see if we can come out with a plan and potentially some version that we could support. Does that require a motion? I don't think so. The motion died. Um, yeah, right. So at this yeah. point, I think it's an action item for Trevor to schedule a joint meeting and see if we can work on some type of plan or you know clear guidance for the energy committee um, to help them draft either uh, you know both something that the select board can support as well as a plan going forward that will, well, in my opinion, I'd love to see something that's very action item oriented, has dollar values associated with it, and results that we would expect to get out of it because I think that's the level of detail we need to get to, to give to our legislators and decision makers to try to get this funding and get these action items that we need to be successful. And I think that would be an awesome outcome out of a joint meeting. So I would agree with that. And I'm gonna give Gary a little homework. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so before you do that, I would like you to reach out to Two Rivers and probably Tori has this information. And I'd like to know what our current energy energy needs are and what we're currently generating here in house, so to speak, um, to accomplish those goals. And uh, I think she can probably provide you with that because she was able to give that to me a year ago. She had those numbers. Okay. So that would be a good place to start because then you've got then you then you've got a, a you know the what road you've got to go down and how you're going to get there. Now I don't know if anybody's got any forecasting as to how much more demand is going to come online, but it would be nice to know that. And hopefully that would be offset by conservation and weatherizing. Well, but she she should be able to give you some of that stuff. Again, I went to that renewable energy Vermont meeting a couple of days ago, and Green Mountain Power and the others are are. are looking to find ways that, where they can double or triple their electricity outputs because they're determined that we got to run everything off of electricity and we don't have the lines to support it. So uh, that's the oh, reality oh, yeah. of it. 
you'll find that interesting. I just read an article about that where if, if 10 people on the same street were to get a car charger and buy electric cars, their section, the little, their little portion of the grid fails. So those are some other things that need to be addressed here. It's a, it's a big, big problem. Yeah, that's a big problem. So those are some things that are, those are the obstacles that I see here. And, you know, if you go look in the East Valley, I don't remember when the last time that some of those lines were upgraded, but I'm pretty sure that, you know, they're all in the works. I know that because as they look at this, but it's just like my broadband. If you notice, I dropped out again here. So, you know, there's still going to be people left out in the dark. Well, I guarantee you it's, it will be in the uh, December 1 action plans of, of, the, of the council somewhere. It's very comprehensive. Yep. Okay, well, let's start right. with Tori and have her give you some basics, okay? Right, but, the, but, the, but that's the end point. And I totally agree. We start with Randolph Towns and go from there. Correct. So I think we've hammered this enough tonight. And given that we have a full agenda, I'd like to move to the next item on the agenda, unless yeah. somebody has something massive they got to share. Well, I, I want to talk to when we would have this a joint meeting. I could There'll be a doodle poll coming out from Trevor and everybody can respond and then we'll find okay. a date that works for everybody. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah, thank you. All right. So moving to the next item, we have the Maple Street scoping study. Is I think we had last touched base on this in August and then with the cancellation of the September meeting, we've got the proposal back from the consultant. This would amend the, this is a 2018 era scoping study uh, designed to look at uh, road surface, traffic patterns, uh, improvement or replacement of water, wastewater, stormwater infrastructure, and to come up with the cost estimates, the two missing pieces from what the pieces needed to finish based on that original scope were the traffic impact assessment. So this would measure what happens if we remain at a two-way as we are now versus switching to a one-way in some direction for some length later on. That's more involved than, than originally uh, anticipated when we tried to use some traffic count data from two rivers. So this would combine counts and some, um, some modeling that happens in, in, I forget the name of the software program to try to measure that impact. So then you've got that data set to try to make a decision on when the time comes. And then it'll update the cost estimates because those are now uh, a couple of years old. Um, the total proposed value of the amendment um, is $11,700, but should finalize this study and put us at a spot where we can make the decision to move forward and see that that money gets into capital programs and budgets and, and moves the project forward at some point from there. So it's really the remaining piece of the puzzle to do some of the decision making. Any questions? Comments, thoughts, motions? When would we have this back? Uh, we probably have it back. A, there's a good chance for the December meeting if everything could fall into place. Um, it takes a couple of weeks. There's a couple of weeks um, for the traffic counts, which is linking those up and getting the counters, in this case, people at it at key points and then running it through the system. Most of the time involved is in the traffic impact assessment. But if I'm remembering the conversation, four to six weeks was doable once we've authorized. Um, so I would say by, by that December meeting would be our target if possible. Okay, can you hear me, Trevor? I can, Pat. Trevor? Uh, yes. I'm having, all sorts of, I'm having all sorts of trouble with the audio. I was okay. trying to second Larry's motion okay. and I nobody could hear me apparently. No. Oh. I was trying to second Larry's motion, plus I didn't hear two thirds of what was going on. You can hear us okay right now though. Uh, I can't hear you. Yeah. I can right now. Okay. I can right at this minute. So Pat, in prior meetings, you've tried calling in also, that might be- I would move amendment option for you what's that In the past, so video reduces your 
amount of information of data and whatnot you can receive. So shutting off your video will help you get better, but you might want to try calling in also. I tried that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Not good. Can you hear me now? Can hear you now, Pat. Can you hear us? Okay. Half of, half of the time or two thirds of the time, I can't. But I would move to a, approve the amendment. If, I don't know if you heard that or not. We heard that one, Pat. Thank you. We have a motion to approve the amendment for the Maple Street scoping. I'll second. Okay. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Abstained? Motion carries. Carry. Consider adopting the Vermont Community Development Program Municipal Policies and Codes. So this is one of the grant requirements tied to, I believe, the um, Orange County Parent Child Center. I don't know if I can't, I have glasses coming, but I can't see if Josh is here with us. He might be able to answer more of the questions. But these municipal Josh policy is codes, Josh is yeah, here, yeah. these forms often probably look familiar um, to folks that are often one of the grant requirements. They're fairly standard in terms of equal op employment opportunity policies, fair housing policies. Um, a few of the others may tie into the generally to the to the source of the funding which comes through HUD more often than not for the VCDP programs, uh, the Vermont Community Development Program funding program. Um, so this is this is one of those requirements that comes with it. And I don't know, Josh, if I missed anything, or there's more to more to throw in there. Yeah, I would just say it's it's uh, it's generally a form that covers state and federal regulations. So they're just ensuring that we're adhering to them. We have a lot of the documents actually posted in the hallway um, as required by law. Um, but this was a, a change from uh, the state of Vermont um, to, to have municipalities sign on to this as a VCDP requirement. So. In order to receive VCDP uh, funding, uh, municipalities have to adopt this resolution. So we've uh, adopted this in the past. Does it have to be adopted with each grant? Uh, not, not to my knowledge. I think this was a, I think this was a different form that they have adopted, because I, I don't remember seeing this in, in previous um, VCDP grants. Um, uh, with the town, um, it, they made it sound like it was something that was fairly new. And it, it indicates on the bottom it was revised last February, so that could be when and why. If there's a revised version, we'd have to readopt, and I don't think we've acted on them since February, say. Right, yeah, the last time we would have uh, uh, acted on it would have been with LED Dynamics in 2018. Yep. So do we have uh, any questions on the policies and codes? Hearing none, any motions to approve accepting them? So moved. I'll second. Second. Motion and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Who, uh, Pat, were you approving? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, you just came in a little late. Just wanted to make sure of your vote. Yeah. Motion carries. Yes. <laughs> we got it. ARPA Funding Committee, scope of work. 
This is a, just a standing item. We've had it on an earlier version. We still need to develop that, that formal scope of work. All of the money is in hand, and that's our direct payments in our county funds. So a little less than 1.4 million. We just didn't want to have it get lost in the in-between, but with some of our recent um, uh, staffing related challenges, this is one of those projects that, that hasn't as advanced, advanced as far as we had hoped by this point, but we still have time to keep it moving. So just wanted to leave it on there, um, make sure as much as anything, I think we shared it with the board that the county money had come to us already. But to, to share more broadly and with the public that um, the first payment is in for both of those pieces. So the $685,000 $685, dollars shown there, um, and then another $685,000 um, will appear at some point in 2022. We're thinking in the May, June timeframe. Um, haven't heard for sure on that. So we'll develop that scope, um, get that, that group together, and um, start to really dig into what, what can or can't happen. There have been an increasing number of ARPA funding related um, programming opportunities from folks like VLCT and, and, and the state and a few others. So we'll be able to glean some information to help us along now that that has really ramped up. That's one of the things that's changed a little bit from when we first talked about this in July or August, whatever it was, but there's more, more opportunity to learn. Um, and so we'll look to take advantage of those as well, but just didn't want to lose it. It's really just a quick check-in. That's where we're at. Uh, we have until was it, 2024 to obligate the money and 2026 to spend it. So there's some, there's some time still. Um, Tre Trevor, I have two questions. Can you hear me? Pat? Yeah, I got you. Yeah. Um, my first question is when do we hope to have the committee working up and working? I think if we had a scope of work for November, you could have the committee up and working at some point in, in December, um, for example, and then you have recommendations. It would depend on, on how we shape the scope, but I don't think it'll be a long timeline. And I, I think by then we'll have a good sense of the baseline from what's allowed and what's not. Um, and a little bit of data on how folks have spent money already and whether or not that, that is truly permissible. And I know the Capital Planning and Budget Committee would like to be involved some way in that. I, I, I think that makes sense if anything falls within their purview, but if it, if it tends into operational or other programmatic elements, that may not make as much sense. So maybe in November, we'll have a proposal of what that committee looks like and what a draft charge for it is. Yeah, yeah, we'd, we'd outlined a couple of things to include in the scope of work and have copied them here um, in terms of what the, the general task will be, but we'll try to draw those out so there's a, a better list of what we're asking folks to do. Okay, good. So any other questions on on that or comments? We look forward to November. Next up is uh, formalizing the assessor hire. Yep. Uh, you got the, the letter and provided a, a tentative thumbs up um, back in September when we were canceling that meeting um, for the leanness of the agenda. Uh, we're looking just to formalize that initial blessing. You've got the letter from Dennis. Uh, Brown, which explains the, the process, what they had to do and how they have to do it and how do you fit in there. So that's a recommendation of the Board of Listers that the board, select board, then will uh, essentially approve. And when you do that, um, we'll fully formalize Mimi's hire uh, retroactive. It doesn't say it in the motion, but it should probably go retroactive to, what was your first name, Mimi? September, September 1st. Yeah. So adding that to the motion may not be a bad idea, just to, to make sure it's fully clear. Uh, Mimi's been in the chair doing the work, attending the trainings, um, sharing cookies. So she's jumped right in and, and, and has been at the helm since then. So. so this is ratifying the vote to yep. hire her Mimi effective 9-1. How will this affect 
I'm familiar with this situation in other communities. In fact, I chatted with you earlier this week about um, Bridgewater just hired an assessor. That assessor is just placed in where he was listed. What's happening here? No, this is this is perpetuating the model we've had, okay. where we've had a, a, a hired assessor improvise most of the staffing, does a lot of the, the technical pieces, but they work with the board of listers. The challenge we're going to have that we even saw a little bit in the hiring process is that people aren't lining up to, to serve as volunteer members of the board of listers. And so with Mimi's move over to the assessor's office, it leaves just Dennis. So that if we need a decision, um, wait, would you still, I'm still, a still count? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're trying to figure out how to work that, but ideally we'd be able to have a board of listers and an assessor and there'd be four people, but currently we have two for four spaces. Um, so that way the board of listers can take any action it needs to meet the form requirements more easily and avoid any kind of conflicts. So it's really it's the system we've had opposed to, to one where you take one piece out and go just with an assessor. Which, uh, it was a model that some places have got to mention one. Yeah. Essex years ago had, had moved to that. Yeah. Bridgewater did it out of necessity because of the great thing you just cited, which is yeah. that they couldn't find people to step up to do it. I think that'll be more and more common just because it's, it's a hard thing to fill. There's an increasing level of complexity, I think, especially when you get into um, talking through some of the state payments and homestead declaration penalties and, and, and some of the different updates. And, and that's a fairly mild example of some of the stuff you encounter. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I, I wonder if sometimes we find that we feel that kind of pressure as well, just out of necessity or, or circumstance. But, but for now, we'll, we'll keep going. I just wanted to get some yeah. clarity on there. Yeah, that's a great question. And miss that up. Miss that up. No, okay. um, just to make clear, the assessor would still work for and under the board of listers, as in the past. So we have uh, we've already approved the electronic ways through email hiring Mimi looking for a motion to ratify that vote. So Can you hear me? Second. We got you, Pat. Have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next up is the North Reservoir Tank and Well Project. Yeah, another, another one we just wanted to correct, provide a quick check in. It's been a little bit, I think. Um, we're still on schedule for construction in the spring. Um, this will replace the, the tank up at the Ellis lot. And um, there's some additional well components to that. That'll allow us to take the Pearl Street well, which is the one uh, plagued a bit by the high levels of manganese offline. As a primary water source, it's still there as an emergency capacity source, um, whether it be for fire protection or, or some kind of low water situation. Um, so it remains online. But we're at the, the phase of, of, of that 90% of the design plans are complete. We meet on Friday with the engineer and um, one of the key folks uh, from the Agency of Natural Resources to review those plans. There's nothing really in the project scope itself that is all that different than, than what you've seen in the past. Um, the one big change which is noted here is that the, the cost estimates we've been using are from 2018, um, so pre-pandemic. And, um, and then also covering, you know, that's three years hence, so it's um, um, things change in cost. So what we've actually gotten to now is, a, is an estimate at this point from September, about mid-September, um, of $2,439,000 for the project. Um, is, uh, we've had about available, uh, in terms of our, our funding sources that we've lined up to date, it's $2.25 million. And we had actually had a little bit of cushion in that earlier estimate in that funding model. And that's a mix of, we've got about a million and a half in loan funds from the state revolving fund program. And there are two other grants that fall in there. There's a um, $300,000 CDBG grant and a $450,000 grant from the Northern Borders folks. So that swing in price, should it hold up, 
Um, leaves us about $189,000, I think it works out to be, um, shy of being able to fund the, the full ask at this point. We've reached out to the SRF folks through the engineer for options. Hopefully we'll be able to cover some of those tomorrow or sooner than later. Um, we do know that this would be ARPA eligible if we really got into a pickle. Um, we could fill the hole that way. Um, there's also going back to voters say in, in, in March at town meeting and asking to, to increase the prior authorization. So we'll sort through what those are. Um, there's also some hope that as we get into project refinement from here and we get into some of the bidding process that maybe there are either ways we can find to value engineer and bring that cost down a little bit or that some of these material and supply um, the issues that we're seeing show up in price now, uh, either resolve or uh, start to uh, you know, come, you know, regress to the mean, basically. Um, so we've, we've seen this across material categories and supply categories, um, from everyday pro products to, um, to the ones that you need for this piping conduit, those types of things in, in particular have big lean times and, and have carried increased prices. So just wanted to provide a little bit of an update we're at the 90% piece, we'll go through that. Um, that'll link into um, formalizing that prior authorization of SRF funding. We still have that step to take. Um, we're well uh, in the space we need to be in with regards to the Northern Borders Grant, some of the timelines there. Um, and it's just really shoring up that final funding piece. But at, at a minimum, we could always say, because we've got the 685 and ARPA funds now, and 1.4 almost total, if we had to, there, there's a way to plug that hole that, that um, doesn't fall squarely on uh, on any one group, but um, you know, certainly has that benefit for anybody in the district. So we'll bring you back some options as, as we, we start to develop them more, but wanted to provide an, an update as we go as to where we're at. So at what point do you think we're going to take this out to bid? Uh, right now, the plan would be to go out to bid, I want to say, February for a, an April May construction start, and I will. I think maybe we'll think that might that be again. a little too. Do you think that might be a little too late, given the fact that some of these contractors are probably experiencing labor shortages? And they might want to be. Yeah, I, I'm a little worried, and I think uh, we might be able to go out earlier, especially if the um, you know if the way that the funding hole, so to speak, is fixed is through the, the state applying some other source of funds. Uh, and precluding any need to vote or to go back to the voters, that, that would certainly accelerate our ability to say for sure we, we've got the funds in hand and maybe go out a little bit earlier. From a, from a design standpoint, you know, we're at 90% complete, so we're, we're closer than farther uh, to, to being well, at that point. But, my feeling, given the experiences and the things I'm seeing here going on in all these different sectors, that we need to get that out to bid sooner because just in my own personal experiences, from what I'm working with on my own level, I'm not, you know, our company can't take on the work levels we used to take on because we're not getting the labor. And I have a feeling that you're going to run into the same problem in the construction industry going forward. So it seems to me like it might be a good position for us to see if we can move this process and find a better bid suitor than later, because as everybody else's calendar fills up, we may find ourselves having to delay this no different than I'm having to delay some other projects I'm working on. And bigger than that, even Perry, is the availability of materials. And some of the pipe you're going to need to do this and whatnot could be six to eight months out before you can get it. But another thing to think about is you brought up ARPA as balancing that, and it is eligible, but the committee needs to be formed to look at this because ARPA funds are coming to the town as a whole and not to just the sewer and water district. So that needs to be looked at as, you know, kind of how we, how we use those funds and where they, where they go is a, is a much bigger question. Right, it, it's our, um, I'd say think of it as the in case of emergency big glass option, uh, if, if we've got, nor where else to go, or we some sort of short term. We do have that capability there. But I think I think you're, you're right that those funds are probably a different process. Trevor, can you hear me now? This is Pat. I got you, Pat. I have one. Can you hear me? 
Yeah. Um, about the yeah. revolving loan fund, could they make up the difference? Yeah, that, that was the, the first set of conversations was to see what funding would be available through that, that mechanism. And we'll look, can we meet with the folks from Dufresne Group tomorrow and they and our folks, hopefully we've got some kind of update on as to where they're at with that conversation. Yeah, I know in the past they've done that, so on other projects. Yeah. Other, other projects that we've seen this before, it's usually SRF funds are the, the way you, you make up whatever difference. Any other questions on this one? If not, we'll move on to the uh, North Randolph Road slope stabilization. We sent it out via email to those of you remote. Hopefully we were able to get it. It was closer to showtime. We've got paper copies here in the room. But um, the, the bid review ships um, uh, are available. We went through, we had two bidders at the end of the day. Um, they're within about $1,000 a little left of each other. Um, the hours are pretty similar when you add up all the sub consultants and, and others who work for it. There's about a 10 hour difference between the two. And uh, they've all met, they both met all of the standards, including this one has a requirement to make sure that the, the stabilization study includes a, a no build road closure option. And they both made sure to hit that in the responses as, as, as one of the responses to be considered through the, through the study effort. Um, on the very final page, we went through and scored it using um, a scoring template that we've got from the v Trans Municipal Assistance Bureau from its bid documents. So there's a, a base score and a weighted score basically. And by, um, uh, what's the word I By about a half a, uh, yeah, by about a half a point, um, the, the bid from Dubai Boy and King scores better. And what it really broke down to, they were really the same when you looked at qualifications, project understanding, um, creativity, thoughtfulness of the RFP, completeness. Um, the one little difference in there was in the work sample that we required and that one provided us a work sample that was of a similar stabilization study. And the other one um, sent us something of a, that was an intersection improvement that was a really well done document. So you could see the, the quality of work. It was just sort of the applicability of that product. And that's essentially what, what broke the tie um, in, in that, that uh, weighted scoring system that's, that's there. So the recommendation after going through all that from our level, we'll still have to get the endorsement of, of the Municipal Assistance Bureau folks along the way, but um, just to uh, write that down. To uh, the motion to award the slope stabilization bid to DNK for an amount not to exceed 62,067. The other wrinkle is that we'll have to, um, hopefully we'll be able to find some more money for the project from the from um, VTrans grant programs. If not, we are prepared and able to, to make the additional match through some of our, particularly the stormwater reserve and some other capital reserves. Um, this was originally thought to cost $40,000. That's what the grant anticipates. So there's 32,000 in grant funds, 8,000 in local match. As you can see, the bids are closer to 62 and 63,000. Um, and so we'll, we'll look to um, to fill that hole, hopefully with grant funds, but uh, we are we are able to do that um, with our funds. So uh, this project is a water quality project, given what it where it is and what the challenge is. Um, so it's eligible for water quality funds, both at the state level in specialized programs, but as well as ARPA. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the water quality piece from ARPA would that would be another potential source as well. So if nobody has seen this project, they ought to take a ride down through there. This is not going to be a cheap project when it comes to construction. No, that's that's quite a quite a slope, both in terms of its steepness and its length. And, uh, for those of us that were part of the Irene. Uh, disaster this washed out during Irene too and so the repair that was approved by everybody and was going to make it bulletproof clearly did not stand up uh, 
So we're back at it. Again. How many times is this washed out? How many times is this washed out? Two or three times? I think you're right, Pat. There's two Turn that I know. Of. I mean, we were able to drive right down into the hole and back up the other side with a four by four for an Irene, but I do believe it washed out one time before Irene. Washed even. Yeah, I washed out in I the believe mid 80s. So, yeah. Yeah, in the 80s, that whole section was all rebuilt. So you need a motion? Yes, please. Okay, I'll make a motion that we authorize Du Bois and King to proceed. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Assembly permits for Halloween. Got an assembly permit application and a banner permit application earlier today. We sent you um, the fire department for you. They had a couple they were requesting. Let's see if I can find that real quick so I can read them out to folks. Um, they had uh, proper notice to the adjacent business, businesses regarding the, the fire troop, which is. Um, I described it as when Heidi sent me a picture, and I think Heidi might still be on too. Um, they look like they're spinning flaming hula hoops in the picture. And they, you know, twirl different objects that are on fire um, as part of a performance. So, so when uh, Chief Hildenbrand's talking about those pieces, um, proper notice provided to adjacent businesses regarding that performance. Um, same thing, proper notice to the red line regarding that performance. I, I believe that part's already been done uh, based on the response from Heidi. Um, barriers to enter emergency road can be moved manually and will not require equipment if there's an incident and that any tents don't block access to the entrances to businesses of the red line. So those are the feedback pieces from the village fire department when it looks at the permit applications. Um, there's also the banner permit piece that's in there as well. Um, I think uh, you suggested in, you know, you may have been in that email that Taco Cat Cantina had some concerns, but it looks like they were addressed directly with them. I, I know there was some dialogue. I don't know if anybody's on to, to speak to those, but um, it seemed like it was about making sure there was access to the business and, right. and yeah. how notice was provided and when and those types right. of people were part of that conversation. Right. And we heard from a, a Another entity, individual, not a name, not a business identifier. And we don't have it as of right now. We expressed a similar concern about um, access to a business in that stretch. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But it's because the event's on a Sunday, I believe. Um, I got the time right here. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of those businesses wouldn't be open that day. Anyway, right. So right. the impacts right. would be mitigated just, just by the day of the week. So we've notified all the businesses there that the event's taking place. Heidi, are you there signed in under? As I understand it, the, the business notification in my part was handled through there was some, some communication from the Chamber of Commerce as well as members of the Recreation Committee. I think I'd done some of the outreach and there was the delivery of some flyers. So there was certainly an attempt to, to notify everybody. And I think RACDC may have played a role in, in some of that notification when it came to the red line. Um, I'm, a, I'm picking through the pieces of what occurred. So I, if anybody knows, you can verify. Um, that yes. probably be good. Yeah. yeah, so I'm here from Heidi and I, a month so we put out flyers notifying all the businesses of reminding them of the event and deliver them by hand. So Heidi, have we notified them about the flyer? We just got that um, in today. We just so got that, um, in today. So tomorrow, once if this passes, I will. Sorry, I'm on a phone, so there's a bad echo. Oh, she wants tidy back up.
So Heidi, if I followed your comments, you're, you're you're going to reach out to those businesses now that you secured them as a performer? Correct. Okay. Most of them all know that that would have been a possibility. And so now that it is confirmed, then we will address the area and make sure that they have uh, the area cleared out for the performers. And, and it will be away from the away from the restaurant. So if I understood correctly, they're at the end of the street, right? You're muted, Heidi. You're muted, Heidi. You're correct. The the performance is gonna be on the You're other correct. side. So the other side, meaning what? The so mainstream side, side or the pleasant side? The mainstream side or the pleasant side? Main street side. Main street side. Any trying questions? to figure out also while we talk about how to tamp that echo down a little bit too. So sorry if you if anybody's picking that up. We we are trying to figure out how to make sure we don't catch that as well as we work through our new technology bugs. <laughs> fun fun. Anybody else have any questions about the Halloween event? If not, any motions to approve the assembly and banner permit? I'll move the approval of the uh, permit and the banner for the Halloween event. Second. All those Second. in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Staying motion carries. Next, there's a grant for Kimball for historic preservation. Amy. Actually, no. She's on. Yeah. Amy's hoping to join us. I don't She's on. Yeah. They had a library trustees meeting the same night. Um, so this is one that would have been on that September docket. This is um, there's a twenty thousand dollar grant uh, through the Depart Vermont Division for Historic Preservation. Um, the library has sought permission to apply for that grant as part of the. Um, funding package to repair the, the cupola primarily, uh, where there's some water and other related damage. And this has been an, an ongoing problem as, or challenge as I understand it. Um, the wrinkle with this one is you guys provided the, the tentative uh, electronic approval for the grant application. It's a one-to-one -one match. And um, the, the challenge that's embedded in this one is that this is about a $200,000 project in total. So you've got $20,000 potentially in grant funds. There's another $40,000 that the library trustees have pledged from something called the McNair funds. And then the remainder that is in this request, if the grant were to be awarded um, and the project were to proceed would come from the, the town most likely, unless there were other grant um, foundation, other sources sought and, and, and obtained. And I don't know if that's part of the plan that's if, if anybody does um, who's jumped on, um, certainly steer me in the right direction. Um, so that would leave us with about $140,000 or so to come up with at a local level. Um, in our facilities reserve, this project would most likely occur if the funds were awarded um, in fiscal 23. And so when you look through capital reserves as they are for this year, where they're anticipated to be, and what the draft budgets include um, for transfers, we, we do have a sufficient amount of funds currently projected um, that if we did want to do that, it's envisioned in the capital plan, I think for fiscal 22, there's a $200,000 um, expenditure that's in there. So we, we just went through today and, and identified that in that facility reserve where this project has been listed for fiscal 23, there, there could be about 350 in, in funding. Um, Specifically earmarked to this, or would it? I mean, how much would it yeah. deplete the 
reserve fund. It, in this reserve. So if we did it in fiscal 23 and we said that our baseline goes up to 350, and that presumes that the reserve transfer that's proposed in that draft in the draft budget, everything goes as we're looking at right now. If it um, is at the same level as last year, it was seventy five thousand dollars that was approved to transfer in for twenty two. So even if you you took it level, you're talking there'd be three twenty five to three fifty total in that facilities reserve. That's for every eligible category yeah, of project right, in there. Right. Um, so town buildings generally. So you take the one forty off that, um, and you're talking there's like two hundred and yeah, one hundred eighty five to yeah. two hundred and ten thousand yeah. dollars left. So it's it, there's still enough in there to to meet anticipated needs, but it would frame if the grants awarded, it does frame how we budget for uh, fiscal twenty three, particularly with any expenditures in that facilities coming out of that fill it, facilities reserve. Uh, we may have so to make some Trevor, adjustments. There, Trevor, where does the uh, capital budget committee put this expenditure in a priority order? Because I'm really not in favor of, hey, I got a small grant towards a major purchase. Uh, let me jump the pecking order in capital improvements that are needed. So when they look at the capital budget, which is we have a committee that does that, where do they rank this specific project with all the rest of them? I, I honestly don't know. I, I don't know where they're at uh, with this or... With, with much else, frankly. Right. How, how much are they allocating from the um, fund of their own? Uh, there would be 40000 from the, the trustees. Okay. And that, the name of that fund again? Uh, McNair. Okay, I, I know what that is. Yeah. Um, uh, Chandler and the library and the food shelf and maybe one other organization were left $250,000 requests each about 18 months ago from Mr. McNair. So I don't know how they decide how much of that in case the trustees to expend on what, but there, there was a pretty significant pool of money there. So mm -hmm. just share that with you. And this is one of those that I, um, unless there's a grant award, um, you could you could approve or authorize the application for the smaller grant. And unless there's a grant award, there isn't necessarily any need to come back and commit any funds until such time as you want to accept said award is one other way to think about it so that we can explore it. But when you do think of it just as a mathematical problem, that a grant for 10% of the total, driving the response plan and, and, and some of the other funding, you know, most of the time that's that's not the, the the ratio or the setup that we look for when we enter into seeking a grant for a project of some kind. Doesn't mean that you couldn't, it just it flips that uh, that ratio a little mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. Usually you're looking for an 80-20 kind of split. Um, or 90 10 or whatever you can get, hopefully 100 0, but mostly they're 80 20. Yeah. This would be 10 90. Right, right. Is there any time frame on when this had to be spent by? That uh, would depend on the grant award. Yeah. I, I was just yeah. curious if there was some discussion about funds had to be used by what date. Yeah, let me see if I can pull that real quick while you're considering. Is the right one for security? They've sent me a new link so I can do it twice. I may not be able to open that file just based on the security link if it goes back to the library rather than to me directly, but that would be where the timeline would be laid out for if we accepted the grant, signed the grant agreement. What's the timeline when, for project completion? When, when, the, when does the grant have to be submitted by? This one was due October 15th, the grant, or the $20,000 grant. And you had, 
informally blessed that earlier. The, the right, granted, right. A twenty thousand dollar piece. Right. Trevor, can you hear me? Yep. Yep, Pat, I got you. Will this be put out to bid? Or is this so specialized you can't? I would imagine there'd be a, a grant agreement requirement for bidding, but I, I don't know the particular nature of the project and with historic preservation grants, um, if that alters that equation at all. The reason I asked is in the explanation, it talks about 166 or so to do the cupola, but then there's a window that needs replacing and it went up to 200,000. Mm -hmm. That seemed excessive unless, until I knew more about it. Right. So it sounds like there's more information needed on this, including a way in from the Capital Budget Committee. We've already submitted the grant though, right? Yeah, the, the $20,000 grant, if we're awarded it and the funding isn't worked out, then the option is not to accept the grant at that time. Not a great look, but better than committing to something we, we can't fund or haven't prioritized. So what's the we action? need to affirm the electronic vote? Yeah, I, I think for tonight, the only action that's required is to, to essentially ratify the vote to apply for the $20,000 grant and to stay silent for now on the funding proposal till there's more info and then you want the capital advisory committee's opinion we can we can link that together so we're looking for a motion to ratify the electronic vote to apply for the grant i'll make right i'll make that motion if you can hear me uh, i will second uh, all right all those in favor hi 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 Opposed, abstained, motion carries. Now we have an ARPA Department of Libraries grant. Yeah, this is a, a previous application. This is money for outdoor furniture, technology collection purchases. And I believe there is no match requirement. I'm just trying to get to the sheet here. Um, so this would be to accept the award of $8,688.39. I'll move to accept the grant. Uh, second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. I would like to comment that's a very interesting amount for a grant though. Eight thousand six hundred eighty eight thirty nine cents. Like <laughs> right down to the pennies. Yeah, it's a it's a bit precise for sure. All right, it sounds we'll like they had a certain amount of money and split it up. It sounds yeah, like they had a certain amount of money and split it up equally. Yeah. Next up, we have the multi town bylaw modernization grant with two rivers. No, Josh, did you hang in there with us? Yep, nope, I'm still here. Yeah, Josh might be the, the best one to, to get you into this conversation here, having been the closest to it. You were on that call earlier today, I believe, too. So Yeah, I, and I don't know if the select board had enough um, time to get the revised copy. Tori from Two Rivers sent it out to us after our call this afternoon. There wasn't um, a lot that had changed from the original draft that was given to you um, yesterday, I think, because uh, that was the first time we got the, uh, the, the draft, but uh, a little bit of the budget had changed um, on their line items. But the, 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 the basic goal is uh, to submit 
as Randolph being the lead applicant um, for this consortium application um, to do a seven town um, project where Two Rivers will come in and review bylaws and go through a process where they engage the planning commission, the select board, several meetings um, and get some uh, revised bylaws um, to propose um, to each municipality um, where then the recommendation that they're offering is to adopt the recommendations as an interim bylaw adoption process. And then after that, go through the traditional uh, bylaw adoption process with the full public hearings with the public or with the planning commission and then the select board. Um, most importantly for Randolph, um, if, if you look on the, the, the draft application, it has a list of the Randolph zoning districts um, that they're going to be focusing on. Um, after looking at that, you know, I sent a question to them as to, you know, why they didn't include the residential district. Um, but I, I think I already know that answer, which is they were most focused on those districts closest to the downtown and, and those that are already on the public system. Um, to get that um, concentrated density um, in, around the village. So, Josh, what what does the inter, what's the reason for the interim uh, process as opposed to just going direct, directly to uh, a permanent adoption? In other words, would this enable us to do things on an interim basis that might <laughs> not be approved in the end run? Do you see what I'm asking? No, I, I, I totally understand that. Um, that's a valid question. And it was, it was one that was asked, um, it, you know, uh, during our meeting this afternoon. Um, so the explanation that Two Rivers gave was, it was the most efficient way um, for all of the municipalities to get the recommendations adopted um, mm -hmm. because Two Rivers is putting up the match for this, it also allows them to recover that um, because ACCD said that if municipalities um, adopted them inter with, through the interim process, they could then recover that match component. I, I don't want to say that it's all financial, um, you know, driven, but, you know, certainly that's not what they said during the meeting. Um, they said it was more because of the efficiency of the process. Um, so, I mean, we, we've done this, you know, most recently with our planning commission and select board. So we know what that process is like and, and it can take several months for sure. Mm -hmm. Josh, this is Pat. I have a question. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, thanks. Um, do we have the staff at this point to be the lead town on this? So the the so um, Two Rivers has committed to obviously you know preparing the application um, with input from the rest of the municipalities. Um, so you know. It's done. We're, we're trying to collect all of the uh, resolutions uh, from the various municipalities to do this. Um, that's not that much work. Um, and, and so if we are awarded the funds, um, what we would end up having responsibility for is the sort of um, writing the checks, as you will, because Two Rivers has also... Um, dedicated themselves to writing the uh, grant reports um, for the process. So, it, so it's my understanding, yes, yeah, I, my understanding is like, yes, uh, there's not gonna be a lot of work for the town of Randolph. Um, all of the paperwork reporting will be done by Two Rivers. It'll be given to us and we yep. will be submitting uh, through the state of Vermont's system. Um, and 
when there are checks to be dispersed, we will be acting on those invoices. So um, the finance department will have to cut the checks, but I think that's a pretty um, insignificant um, piece of their work, just what, what one invoice and a check. It, it I looks was like just wondering what was. I was just wondering what was required on our part. Thank you. Yep. And if I'm reading this correctly, it looks like um, it's it's a maximum of sixty thousand dollars plus a six thousand ten percent match, and that's split seven ways, right? So, so, so like I said, um, sixty thousand will be from the state. The six thousand is being covered by two rivers. So they're going right. to cover. They're going to cover the match, um, and they only get the match back to them if all of the municipalities adopt the recommendations. Right, but is each municipality getting one seventh of that pie? Uh, um, it's so um, each municipality will get. It's not. It's not so much money going to the municipality. It's money going to two rivers to, to do the work, right? Oh, so so right. all of the municipalities, planning commissions and select boards will get all equal time in updating in meetings and, and so forth. So I think what they plan um, in the budget is um, three meetings for each of the planning commissions. Um, there's going to be a... Uh, a, sort of a, a consortium meeting, you know, like a, like a virtual kickoff meeting, a consortium meeting. Um, there will be two of those. They'll be virtual, uh, of course. Um, and then let's see. And then the select boards will all have um, several meetings too. Um, so they they are uh, uh, allocating six hours for each select board um, for this process. Any other questions for Josh? If not, any motions? I'll move I'll that move we... to. <laughs> Go ahead, Pat. I'll move to accept this proposal. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Abstain. Motion carries. Uh, next up is old business. No, we've got for you. Uh, other business. Seeing none, the manager's report. Just uh, three pieces there. We amended two of them since we sent this out. Um, one is the meeting technology. Um, we're in the room, you can see that we've got multiple screens, the owl set up. We'll work to eliminate the echoes or try to figure out what, what that is um, for those calling in. But this will better enable us to do hybrid meetings. There's a similar setup upstairs in the conference room, it's just the one monitor, uh, and the owl is very, very portable. Um, it provides the camera speaker and microphone. Is that the owl there? Functions, yep. Yeah, if you can, I don't know if you can see the little eyes on it on this oh, side. Oh, yeah, 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 it does look, it looks so it like the white profile. of the page, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the other one was just that we did connect with um, Greg Russ at the East River Partnership on the East Randolph Dam, which he said has been known as the, um, the Gulf Road Dam, I guess. Um, this is at the intersection of 66 and 14, and they've got the, both the money and the capability to do a feasibility study and some initial design work and so they can do all of the heavy lifting on whether or not it's feasible and prudent to remove that dam. It's the final dam remaining on the second branch so there's both a water quality and aquatic organism movement components to, to why that, that may be worth exploring in addition to how it would um, uh, impact anybody who's currently in a, in a flood hazard area or flood zone. Um, so they're able to do that. If there are any objections, we'll reach out to them tomorrow to, to say go ahead, they're queued up. This process isn't a quick one. He said uh, three to five years, um, and there'll be you know, different levels of stakeholder meeting, historic preservation. There's certainly the uh, natural resources and environmental components of it, um, but they're the same group. 
um, that was involved in the, it's the high dam down in East Bethel, about five miles down the road from this one, um, and, uh, and helped with, with all the pieces. And that one, I think he said took, I don't know if that was a five-year one, but there was some stakeholder, neighbor, landowner stuff uh, embedded in that, that that stretched out the timeline. But he said three to five. Army Corps of Engineers is involved, so it's it's got quite a few steps. The first one is, is it feasible? And part of that ties into what that bridge sits on right there. Um, if it's on ledge or if it's somehow anchored some other way, that could could impact that. Um, and then what is initial design? And then if we did ever get to the spot where we wanted to go forward, they've also got access to or funding available for um, the rest of the of the project. Um, so it's possible that we have a limited um, financial stake in this. So we're the, the owners of the dam. And, uh, um, but you'll get more information from step one and then we pass, you know, what's, what's feasible and what would it look like. Um, so if everybody's okay with that, we'll, we'll, we'll move forward with that piece. And then that could be you know, six months to a year before they're checking back in, having completed that piece. So it's, it's none of this moves real quick, but. I just had a quick question on the technology. If you know, I'm sitting here looking at it, is this interfacing with Orca? Ooh, is that? Uh, yeah, they're they're pulling our video feed in addition to the one in the room. Oh, cool, good. That's great. Uh, I knew there was some uncertainty about that the last time we talked about it. That's awesome. Yeah. Trevor, this Pat. I have a question. Sure. Yeah, are my problems tonight with? Um, Audio, are those anything to do with the technology or are they? Uh, I suspect it's, um, yeah. yeah, I suspect it's the problem Harry has and that Trini's probably having too in terms of the broadband and the capability of it, of it on that end and whether or not it can capably do both pieces. We've been able to hear, um, you know, anybody who's got the, the capacity for video and audio has, has come through clear without much um, stuff. We haven't seen any error messages on this end. We'll look into it and make sure it's nothing here. But my guess might be that it's on, on the output end at, at the user end, um, as opposed to the Apple and, and Zoom combination here. But we'll make sure that it's not. Yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. My I haven't had that problem. Yeah, well, I'm having more problems tonight than I normally have, too, so. Okay. Yeah. So maybe it is. Maybe there's something here then. I don't. I don't I have think not it's not had that problem before. Well, I don't think. I don't think it's the problem with the system. I think it's problem with my my internet connection here because, like I said, I'm still on two telephone wires. Do we have anything else in the manager's report, Trevor? That was it. We hope to be open to the public tomorrow, if not Monday. Um, Tax collections underway. That's been the bulk of the business lately. Um, those are the big pieces. Great. Next up, we have executive session. Assume that's still needed, Trevor. Yeah, just a few things to, to update you on. Um, I entertain a motion from. Folks to I move, move that we go into. Uh, I move that we go into executive session for the purpose of uh, purposes stated here: contract negotiations, personnel, real estate, and legal updates. Second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.